session this evening is ICS in a nutshell, putting ICS into practice. And our presenter is James Slater. James is a trainer with the Office of Emergency Preparedness in the Virginia Department of Health. James's responsibilities lie within the emergency preparedness realm and how it relates to public health preparedness. His current scope of work focuses on emergency operations and coordination, which is application of incident command structure, uh, HCEP exercises, um, and statewide communication systems. In addition, he provides support to medical countermeasure and dispensing operations, along with medical material management and distribution. Mr. Slater draws on experience staffing the ESS-8 desk at the Virginia Emergency Operations Center when activated during statewide events like medical, weather, and emerging threats. So thank you all again for uh, joining us. And James, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kate. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, and as Kate said that uh, we're going to be looking at incident command system or ICS um, in a nutshell. Um, it, it looks a little more at ICS as well as what's called NIMS, which is, which is the National Incident Management System. Um, so we'll be looking at a combination of the two because they kind of go hand in hand with each other. Um, I know that sometimes, you know, when you look at some of these acronym courses of ICS and NIMS and you know, you have your ICS 100, 200, 700, uh, you have 300, 800, 400. They can be kind of overwhelming and thinking, well, what do I really need to know out of each of them? Well, the answer is really depending upon what your role is going to be and, and how you're going to apply it. Um, you know, ICS something, ICS is as we go through this, you're going to see it's actually something that you use on a day to day basis without even realizing it. This is just to capturing some of those roles and putting uh, terminologies behind them. So the objectives that I really want to focus on today um, or this evening is um, a couple of things. I want to identify three purposes of ICS. Um, I want to explain the benefits of using ICS and explain the purpose of the National Incident Management System known as NIMS. Okay. We're also going to look at describing the basic features of ICS. Uh, we're going to look at explaining the benefits of using ICS, um, why we use it, how we use it, um, and explain the difference between NIMS and ICS. Because as I said, they go hand in hand, but they are definitely different. And ultimately, I want to recognize that NIMS and ICS discussions can be filled um, with TLAs. And I know you're thinking, well, what is this TLAs? You know, you've heard me talk about NIMS, you've heard me talk about ICS. And again, we, we, we use a lot of things or a lot of three letter words, and that's three letter acronyms. You know, unfortunately, uh, FEMA, which is an acronym in and of itself, says don't thou shalt not use um, acronyms. You need to use common terminology, plain language. Unfortunately, everything that they do is acronyms. They, they tie it to three letters or four letters. Um, so it makes it easier to remember. The problem is, is it's not really cross cutting across all fields. Um, you know, most of us um, on this call apply our um, three letter acronyms towards health, but those three letter acronyms also in other roles and in other industries mean something completely different. So we just have to be careful with that. So I'm gonna show you a quick video. So just bear with me one moment here. This tornado was a monster and it was vicious and it, it did not discriminate in its destruction across our city. And growing up here, uh, you couldn't see from one side of town to the other. And to see a, a six mile path, a mile wide of your city gone, to have hundreds of people who are walking in the middle of the street, many of them bleeding, making their way to the hospital. Uh, the enormity of this begins to hit you. I knew clearly that this is something you can't walk alone. Uh, not one person, not one government can handle this. 5.30 when I pulled the IC team together for my first briefing, I told them how we respond to this will dictate how we recover as a community. And as long as we were coordinated and we were calm and we were compassionate, we would make it through this terrible crisis here in Tuscaloosa. The IC structure gives that because everyone's in one room. 
the police chief, the fire chief, the TDOT director, environmental services director, their chain of commands are working up into that room and then it's coming back down. And ultimately, as, as mayor, um, you know, I'm in there as well making sure that the needs of the entire city are being met. Uh, within the first five minutes after the tornado had uh, left the city of Tuscaloosa, we realized that our Curry facility was destroyed, which housed our EMA, Facilities Maintenance, and Environmental Services Department. Over 100 of our uh, vehicles, garbage trucks, trash fleet destroyed. Our main communication tower was destroyed. A police precinct was destroyed. A fire station was destroyed. Our sewer treatment plant was damaged and almost rendered inoperable. And if we wouldn't have gone through this training, it would have been a disjointed effort. And what I mean by that is this. If we wouldn't have gone through Emmitsburg, we'd have had PD doing their own thing, fire and rescue doing their own thing, environmental services doing their own thing. The IC immediately begins resource allocation. For example, we had no environmental services department. It was gone. We had more than 100 employees who literally had nothing to do. We lost water pressure in East Tuscaloosa. All of this is coming through the incident command. So immediately, Incident Command says, those 100 employees who don't have anything to do today, they're going to go out and walk water lines with grid maps, and at every leak, we're going to stop and then call in a crew to fix that leak. Eight times a year, we host Alabama football, which basically takes the population of our city from 100,000 to 250,000. Uh, and since 9-11, we knew that we needed to improve our homeland security uh, methods. We also knew that if there was an event um, during an Alabama game day, it would tax our resources. So we thought this training would be a good way to uh, go from a desktop exercise to really get into the nuts and bolts of handling a disaster. And knowing that we're also in Tornado Alley for the South, uh, we thought that this would also sharpen our skills and, and those responses. We have become the model of how you respond to a disaster. And it all started with the structure. If you don't have command and control, then you cannot respond in a disaster. You, you can't fly by the seat of your pants. Clearly, in, in the last uh, few weeks, we've demonstrated that that training paid huge dividends. All right, so that, that video kind of illustrates, you know, the big picture. Um, you know, we're looking at it from the thousand foot view. Um, when we're able to staff like an ESF or emergency support function through um, working at the Department of Emergency Management, you know, we're, we're functioning for ESF-8, which is public health. Um, you know, public health is kind of all encompassing in Virginia. So it's one of those things that, you know, we handle, you know, Office of Emergency Medical Services. Um, we also handle uh, the office of the chief medical examiner, um, in addition to basic public health functions, um, and an offshoot of the ESF or emergency support function eight is the ESF three, which is uh, our water. Um, you know, our uh, department of drinking water within VDH has its own support function because they handle more than just you know water. They handle dams, they handle infrastructure. Um, so it's kind of all encompassing and we kind of all being co-located all in the same room allows us to have these conversations. So when we looked at that tornado, you know, the question is, what is really is an incident? Um, you know, the definition of an incident for FEMA is that it's an occurrence or an event, natural or man-made, that requires a response to protect life or property. So a little bit of history, um, Virginia adopted the National Incident Management System in November of 2005. Um, the state coordinator of Virginia Department of Emergency Management, known as VDOM, is responsible for NIMS implementation across the state. Um, now, across locality to locality, um, e each of those localities may also have a NIMS compliance officer to make sure that that county um, or locality is doing what they need to do to be in compliance with the NIMS um, directives. Um, you know, a lot, of, especially a lot of the larger counties in Virginia, Fairfax, Arlington, Prince William, uh, Richmond, et cetera. So NIMS, what is it? It's more than just that three letter acronym. Um, NIMS is described as a consistent nationwide approach for federal, state, tribal, and local governments to work effectively and efficiently together to prepare for, 
prevent, respond to, and recover from domestic incidents, regardless of the cause, size, location, or complexity. Um, a few years ago, um, Virginia, uh, well, FEMA uh, really started pushing an all hazards kind of policy. Um, for a long time, things were uh, kind of uh, secluded um, or compartmentalized where, you know, there were bioterrorism incidents or, I mean, in fact, and that's how our program Office of Emergency Repairs got started was actually as a cause of bioterrorism. Um, you know, when you have that offshoot of bioterrorism, you have, uh, you know, weather. Uh, and you think, well, whether what really does uh, Virginia or uh, Virginia Department of Health have to do with weather? Well, we have a lot to do with it. Um, you know, when um, weather comes through, power goes out, environmental health has to go check to make sure, um, you know, food uh, in, in grocery stores, restaurants are something that can be used um, or does it have to be thrown away depending upon the temperature. Um, so there's lots of things that can come into play there. So. You know, I mentioned that NIMS and ICS kind of go hand in hand, but where does ICS fit in? And really, I, I view NIMS as a house. And when you're looking at this picture, you see a nice house. There's some snow out there. Thank goodness we don't have any yet. But, you know, you see this nice brick house. Um, and NIMS is really is considered as that overall structure. Um, and ICS is just one piece of that building. And, and being a piece of that building, when you look at that house, I consider ICS to be a brick. It's a brick in the foundation. And, you know, NIMS really, when you break it out, has a couple of different components. You have resource management. You have command and coordination, which you heard in the video, they mentioned command and coordination. You have the communication and uh, information management, but directly under command and coordination is that incident uh, command system. That's because the commander, incident commander, that's controlling what the incident or the response to it that incident command system falls under that. And that's how everything can be uh, delineated out, how everything can be delegated. So when we look at incident command system, you know, a couple of, there's a couple of key components when we look at that. Um, incident command is a standardized on scene, all hazards incident management. I mean, what that really means is that it doesn't matter what incident or what event that you're using it for, is it standardized? So it doesn't matter if you're from a uh, fire department, if you're from the police department, if you're from public health, if you're from public health, if you have, um, you know, other public safety, then you're looking at different parts of that. Um, and it really allows users to adopt an, um, an integrated organizational structure. So it's plug and play. So if you're working from an other, another organization, you can work with an organization that you don't normally work with because you're talking the same language. Um, it also has considerable flexibility. Um, by flexibility, you know, you can actually scale up or scale down based on the size of the incident. Um, I always look at incident command system as, you know, let's say that, uh, I'm at home and I'm cooking and I, I have a pot on the stove and it boils over and it starts a, a, like a little flash fire. Well, when I look at it, then I, who's the incident commander in that role? Well, I am, I'm the one that's there. I'm the one that's on scene. I'm the one that's handling it. So, you know, I put the fire out, I cover it. And so the fire's out, right? So no need to kind of expand it. But let's say that that same fire, instead of covering it, I throw water on it and it flash fires up and it actually catches the house on fire. A little bit, a little bit of a bigger deal. So then I have to call the fire department in. Fire department's gonna come in and they're gonna become that incident commander. They're gonna um, figure out what they're gonna do um, as far as their processes and procedures and what's safe. Well, let's say that out, out of that fire, they weren't able to put it out and it expands out to the house next door. And maybe let's say that it hits a uh, propane tank. Well, and the propane tank blows up. Well, that's a considerable bigger issue. So that's not just fire involved then. You have the power company, you have the gas company, you have um, pup, uh, uh, the police that are cordoning off roads. Um, you may have them doing an investigation on what caused it. Was it actually the fire or was there some type of um, threat uh, that came into play? So those are the type of things that we can scale up and scale down based on the size of the incident or the event. Um, 
I always say that, you know, one of the things that I use incident management for is uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, you know, when we plan Thanksgiving or Christmas, you know, everybody has a role and, you know, we implement it that way. Um, you know, incident command system has also been a proven management system based on success, uh, successful business practices. So this is something that's used in a lot of different roles. It's not just an emergency management. It's um, I have a friend that uh, has a wedding business and she uses incident command structure to run weddings um, just because it's, it's a delegation of, of roles and everybody knows what they're doing, how they're doing it and who they're reporting to. So when they designed ICS, they designed it to do a few things. Um, they designed it to meet the needs of incidents of any kind and size. So I mentioned being scalable, right, and all hazards. It also uh, was designed to allow personnel from a variety of agencies to meld rapidly uh, to form a common management structure. So, you know, in the event of an, uh, an actual um, incident that happens, you don't have time to kind of figure out who's on first, what's on second. That ICS allows everybody to come together and know what they're how they're going to function, and there's different levels of it, but at the basic level, you know what role that you're going to play. It also was designed to provide logistical and administrative support. Um, you know, to run an incident, especially one of large scale, um, it, it takes people. Um, it takes um, logistics as far as uh, you know. How do you feed people? You know, you have a lot of people on the scene and how do you feed them? Um, how do you move traffic around? Um, that's, you know, that, that takes planning. Um, and if you have those plans in advance, that goes a long way to helping you when you get on site. Um, so ICS goes a long way in planning that out for you. A, a, a great example of that is our pods, our points of dispensing. Um, when we do uh, points of dispensing, you know, there's plans that have been laid forth, you know, where the pod is or where the pod is gonna be. Um, how it's going to be run, who's in charge of it. In, in ICS, we have an incident commander. That's also augmented a little bit for a pod in that we call that the pod manager. And so that pod manager may be running that, uh, running that event. Um, we also look at it being cost effective by avoiding duplication of efforts. If we have a bunch of different agencies um, coming into play, you know, there might be one agency that has a better source of a resource to get what you need than the agency that you work for. So by working together, you can um, not have that duplication of effort. Um, it's cost effective. Maybe you can get things cheaper. Um, when an incident happens, there are certain guidelines under certain agencies that can get applied um, that may not be applied to other agencies. Um, some rules, some laws, some legislation may be in place. Um, you know, a good example of that is when we had the uh, the the fuel uh, uh, pipeline issue a few years ago, and with that fuel pipeline, you know they actually took DOT or Department of Transportation rules off the truckers, so they could work more hours that um, because there's rules in place where you have a uh, number of hours that you can spend on the road. So they took those rules off of those truckers so they could drive more hours to get more fuel to the fuel stations, um, so you could purchase the fuel and there wouldn't be quite as few lines that were in play. So there's lots of things that can come into play there. Um, you know, ICS background, um, we mentioned the history about um, NIMS and how that came into play, but ICS represents um, organizational best practices and has become a protocol um, for incident management um, that really started back in the 70s. Um, ICS came into play during the fire services for wildfires in California. Um, they figured that you know, we have a wildfire that's in one area and it's jumped a ridge and it's in another area, which makes it hard to get to. So you're working with different localities. How do those different localities work together? Um, you have the same need for some of the same resources. Um, and maybe you can get those resources a little more effectively by working together instead of fighting for them. Um, so it really has come into a good best practice to, sit, to work with your neighbors and have those uh, MOUs or memorandums of understanding with the lay on uh, uh, with your neighbor. So ICS doesn't rely just on me and it doesn't rely just on VDH and it doesn't rely just on you. It really has a whole community approach. Um, 
you know, every part of society has to be involved uh, from the federal government. They're only one part of that whole community. Um, you know, a lot of times incidents happen and they think FEMA and the federal government is going to come in and they're going to save everybody and it's going to fix everything. And unfortunately, you know, you know, t so, uh, 10 of the worst words that some people like to hear is that I'm with the government and I'm here to help you. Right. So, you know, it has to be everybody has skin in the game and everybody needs to kind of work together. You know, when we use this whole community approach, it ensures that solutions that serve the entire community. Um, are implemented. And we will look at this bubble and we have, uh, you know, non government organizations. Um, so non government organizations may be, you know, um, uh, places like um, uh, Virginia Blood Services. It could be um, a lot of the volunteer organizations. We have higher education. So, you know, you have schools and colleges and, you know, sometimes higher education, those schools and colleges have dorm rooms. They have big gymnasiums. They have sporting event areas that we can use for uh, shelters and things like that. Uh, you also have state government, which is where we fall in, um, you know, and, and at your level, it's, it may be with the, um, the local or lo locality. Um, you have agriculture, Department of Ag comes into play. So let's say there was a. Um, a radiological release at one of the uh, power stations. So, you know, we have two in the um, in central Virginia area with Surrey and North Anna. And if one of those were to have a release, you know, agriculture or VDAX, uh, Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, would um, be looking at, you know, livestock and livestock feed and how is, how is that, you know, can we do we have to shut down production of stuff like that? Um, then you have transportation. And in Virginia, that's uh, Virginia Department of Trans Transportation. Um, known as VDOT, you know, they look, work at with your roadways, you know, in a snowstorm event, they're plowing roads. Um, and, you know, if there's a flooding event in the James River, they may shut down the ferries because the ferries are controlled by the Department of Transportation. Um, it may be that they're shutting roads down and reworking the roads to have people evacuating um, the Hampton Roads area in the event of a hurricane. Um, we have the chemical nuclear, uh, we have local government, the public works. Uh, healthcare, private sector orgs, and when you think about private sector orgs, you know the one the big boys that kind of come into play there are like Dominion Virginia Power, your uh, energy providers, you have your Verizon's, your um, uh, AT and T's, you have your uh, T Mobile's, you have those private sector orgs that provide communications. They also, um, in event of an emergency, they provide backup community caches. Um, you know, uh, Verizon have uh, these big uh, tractor trailers that roll out and provide cell service in areas that towers have come down in. Um, and then you have your law enforcement. You know, we have your local law enforcement, you have your state police, you have your sheriff's departments, um, and then you have your federal law enforcement officers that are called into play if uh, something larger happens. And, you know, we can't forget the faith-based groups. Um, you know, faith-based groups come into play in a lot of the emergencies that we deal with. They work with us really well, especially in like feeding programs, uh, providing food, uh, providing, um, you know, shelter. Um, you know, some of them are used for shelters short term. Uh, they may provide, you know, short term housing, you know, for people that have fires, things like that. So faith based groups do come into play and they're, they're a real huge resource. Um, you know, and, you know. Every part of society has to be involved. So, you know, I could go on and on about, you know, everyone else that's involved here. But I mean, this is a pretty good summary of and touching on a lot of the ones that we work with through the emergency support functions. So, when does pe public health use ICS or the incident command system? Well, we use it in response um, and preparedness a lot. Um, we use it in bioterrorism threats or events. So that would be like your anthrax uh, threats. That would be uh, pandemics, uh, which would be your disease outbreaks. We have uh, chemical, radiological, and nuclear. Um, those are things that you know happen on a regular basis. We, we sometimes we don't even hear about it, but that's because the plans that have been developed have been put in place, and um, those that are using the ICS uh, system um, know their roles. Um, we also have hurricanes. Um, we have floods. Right now, we're under short, uh, like you know, uh, flood watches across the state because of the rain that we're getting. Um, you know, you know, and I want you guys to think. You know, what are some other examples that you know public health uses ICS? 
Um, you know, a large one was it, you know, we used it, you know, we said disease outbreaks, but those are things that we use on a regular basis. But, you know, definitely we used it during COVID. Uh, ICS was used in a large portion of that. So there are five ICS management functions. So you heard me mention earlier about an incident commander. So incident command is at the top. That's who's going to be responsible for the incident at the end of the day. You um, under incident command, you have your uh, command staff and you have uh, your general staff and you have your general staff, which are operations section. You have your planning section, your logistics and finance and administration. Well, your operation is what I term is the uh, I, I term is the boots on the ground, right? They're the people that are in the field. They're at the incident. They're the firemen at the fire. They're the MRC that are deployed to a shelter. They're the um, ones that are working um, in the field there. That's your operations. They're the ones, they're the doers, right? Without operations, none of the ICS functions function. Planning makes the plan that operations is gonna carry out. They look at, uh, you know, they look at what's happening now. They look at 12, 24, uh, 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 48, 72 hours out. Um, in the blue skies, they're looking at what it, what does it look like when everything's done, right? So they're planning and they're making plans for each of those operational periods that we're working through. Um, logistics is who makes that happen. So, and when you make a plan, in order for operations to carry out said plan, they need stuff, and that stuff may be money, it may be a resource such as a, um, you know, in from the healthcare perspective, masks, gowns, gloves. Right, it could also be at some point something as uh, as, as low as um, uh, oh, and Tom just said they deployed for search and rescue boots on the ground. Yeah, so I mean they're putting them out there, right? So uh, logistics, you know, it could also be something down to your ballpoint pens, like what pens that you're using, paper, um, you know, logistics, making sure that IT works. You know, can I use my computer? We're going to have to use paperwork, right? We're going to have to kick it old school. Um, so they're going to get the stuff and coordinate those things. Well, you know, at the end of the day, that all has to be paid for. So finance and administration section, um, you know, they're usually the ones that are working when after the incident is done, you know, they're working all the way through. And at the end, finance and administration are doing their due diligence on the back end to make sure everything, the T's are crossed, the I's are dotted, the bills are paid. And by bills paid, that means that those that are, um, you know, paid employees, that they're if they're getting overtime, if they're getting um, housing, um, if they're getting all these different things, that's all getting paid for. Um, that things get back to where they're supposed to go, um, and that they're paid for, and that they're in the shape that they're supposed to be when they get there. Finance and administration handles that. Um, I know that a, a great example of finance and an admin working past um, the end of a, a incident, Hurricane Isabel. Um, you know, about twenty years ago. Um, you know, 20 years ago, we had Hurricane Isabel that came through. Five years after Hurricane Isabel hit, finance and administration was still working on uh, crossing the T's and dotting the I's with FEMA to get bills paid. Um, so they're a very important part. And each of these are important in their own way. They just provide that separate role that they know what they need to do and they carry it out. So. This is, may not be your day to day organizational chart, but it may be depending upon how we function in our normal roles. But it is something that we can uh, employ, right? And also deploy. Um, you know, we have across the state, we have incident management teams or IMTs that can be deployed to assist localities um, and even other, other states with working through the incidents that they're dealing with. Um, but you know, when you're looking at the five management functions here, sometimes you're going to wear a different hat. Um, a different hat. Um, you know, you may be a manager or a supervisor in your day-to-day -day work, but you may not be a manager or a supervisor under ICS. Or that may flip. You may not be a manager or supervisor during your day-to-day, -day, but in ICS structure, you've been tasked to be a section chief um, or an operations chief. So when we look at an operations chief, they manage all the incident-related uh, tactical activities. So all that boots on the ground, that operations section chief is in charge of that. 
Um, you also have your planning section chief, and they gather and they disseminate the information uh, critical to the incident. So they're the ones that are helping craft that plan um, that planning is working for, and they're going to get it out, disseminate it, and make sure everybody knows what they need to know as part of that incident. And so that logistics chief, they manage um, and service all the support activities. So as I said, they're, I always look at the logistics chief as that I got a guy. So I know I'm dating myself here with MASH, but like with MASH, you had Radar O'Reilly. And if they, if the, if the colonel needed something, Radar O'Reilly got it for him. He was the, their logistics chief, right? He was the one getting it. No, feast or famine, hell or high water, they're going to get it for you. They're going to figure it out. Um, and I always say that it's the guy to guy that, you know, you always have that friend in your, in your, um, in your world that you live in that, you know, you say, Hey, you know, I got a leaky roof, um, knock on wood. I don't want to have a leaky roof, roof right now with all the rain that we're getting, but I have a leaky roof and the, um, the logistics chief is he's like, I got a guy. You got that neighbor that says, I got a guy, I got a roofer. I'm going to send him to you. Or, you know, I have a handyman that's going to fix whatever your, your need is. So that's who that person plays. And then you have the finance and administration chief, and they're going to manage the on-scene finance and administrative support. So they're, they're making sure that that is all going to happen for you. So when we look at the incident commander, we have that command staff. And under the command staff, it looks a little different. So the command staff, in between the general staff that we just went over, we have that command staff. And the command staff um, usually entails of three different roles. You have a safety officer, and a safety officer is, they're not responsible for the safety of the general public, per se. They're responsible for the safety of everyone within your ICS organization. So that might be the guy when there's a fire and they go to, um, go, go to a building and this building is on fire, the safety officer may look and say, it's not safe for us to go in the building. It's not safe to fight the fire inside. We have to fight it from outside. And so they're going to employ the safety officer, the, their safety plan, and they're going to um, dictate what, how that happens. Then you have the, the liaison officer. And so the liaison officer is the one that's working with those outside of the organization. Um, so let's say that that fire that you, they showed up to, this building that was on fire, let's say it was a hospital. Well, they might be working with the hospital um, ownership group. They might be working with the hospital um, president. Um, whoever's in charge there, the CEO, they might be working with that organization at that level to have that communication back and forth. Because, you know, when we show up to a building, we may not know where the hazardous materials are. We may not know where all the patients have been confined to, that where we need to get them out of. Uh, then we have the information officer, and the information officer is the one that's communicating with the outside public. Um, so that information, we, we call them in your localities, the PIO, the public information officer. They're the ones that's getting that message out. So part of that message, if it's a hospital that's on fire, they might be saying, don't go near the hospital. Traffic has changed. We're, we have evacuation routes in place. They're the ones figuring out, one, you know, what's the vehicle to get the message out with? You know, is it better to go with social media? Is it better to go with print? Is it better to go with, um, you know, your, your um, nightly news? Are those the ways that we're going to get it out? Or should we look at social media? Or should we look at other things? Once they figure out the vehicle, then they're going to figure out how to actually what that message is going to be. Um, and, you know, we use with VDH, we use what's called risk communications. Um, and with risk communications, we're really focusing on, you know, getting it down to the public level on what's digestible. One, um, you know, when you look at um, disseminating information to the general public, you know, a lot of times people that are subject matter experts think that, that you know, they know a lot about what they know. They don't necessarily know a lot about how to communicate that information, and especially from the medical field. Well, a lot of times we fall in the trap of saying, you know, oh, like they, this person has influenza. Well, most the general public, you know, when you say influenza, they kind of tune out and they don't hear that. When you say they got the flu, that makes more sense to them. When you tell them to go get a vaccination, they may also tune that out. We may that PIO is also looking at, okay, we're going to say that, hey, if you get the flu, get a shot. Here's where you go. They make it very simple. So they all fall all within that command staff under the uh, incident commander. And then we back to that planning section, ops section, uh, logistics, and finance and admin. So that makes up your command staff and your general staff. So in an expanding ICS organization, 
it can get bigger. You know, you may need more than just those roles that we've already uh, delineated. Um, you know, under planning, planning can expand out to have units. Uh, operations can have branches, divisions, and groups. Um, and then logistics and finance administration can have uh, units as well. So you might have under logistics, you know, you might have your logistics section chief, but you might have a, um, a feeding section. Right, so the feeding section might be the ones that's responsible to get the food for all the volunteers and for everyone that's working the incident. You may have somebody that's a housing unit. That their only job is to make sure and coordinate the housing. So you can break it down as um, finite as you want to. The trouble that we run into or the trap that we fall is that, as we know, that their staff is that a, a, is that a premium. And, you know, there's only so many people to go around, um, you know, and, that, and that's the great thing with the MRC uh, group is that, you know, a lot of it is filling in those gaps, right? So, you know, if we don't have enough people to do certain roles, sometimes people take on multiple roles. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a sticky situation because they can't focus fully on the role that they've been tasked with. Um, so it, you just have to be careful about how, how you spread. Um, you know, you don't want to spread the peanut butter too thin. Right. So, you know, when we look at this screen, you know, we're looking at how does that flow work? Um, you know, we have assistance and, you know, every incident that happens happens locally, right? They happen in your backyard. They happen in your city. Um, they're not happening here at the state. They're not happening at the federal level, but they are happening at your local EOC. So local EOC may be made aware of what the incident is. That local EOC is going to look local to local with their neighbor. Like I said, they have those mutual aid or the private sector, um, the non-government organization. They may be looking at them for assistance right there within their own backyards. So they're going to look at those first. But they say, okay, well, it's overtaxed. They don't have it. We need to reach out further. So they're going to put that request up to the state EOC. So... That state EOC is going to look at it and they're going to go, okay, well, we're going to send you and we're going to coordinate because, you know, the state may not have what you need, but really the state EOC is a coordination, which is an emergency operations center. Um, so the emergency operations center is that point of coordination, right? That That's all that we're doing. I, I, I In my pocket, I do not have a bulldozer. In my pocket, I don't have a, a box of gloves, right? But I can find them, and we can work uh, with our logistics at the state level, and we can coordinate you getting them, right? So, and that may be with looking at another state. So, you've already done the local to local with your neighbor, right? So, if you've done the local to local with your neighbor, we're going to do the same thing and look local to uh, local. We may be looking to D.C. We may be looking to Maryland. We may be looking to North Carolina, Kentucky, or Tennessee to say, hey, we've got this need. And they're saying, well, we're not, we don't have any need for this, so we're going to send it to you. Awesome. But let's say that they don't have enough, or let's say that they're, they're in the same boat that we are. That, that's what happens a lot with, like, hurricanes, snowstorms. They're in the same boat with us. They, they've had the same issue. They've got the same flooding. They're not going to send their assets because they may need them. Well, that's when we do the reach up to the feds. And we look up the federal agencies and departments. We start reaching up to the CDC. We start reaching up to FEMA. We start reaching up through Homeland Security. Um, we start looking at these other organizations and saying, hey, we need some help. This is what we need. And then they'll send a team, and then they'll help us coordinate with the federal um, at the federal level, utilizing the contracts they have in place to bring those resources to us. So, you know, there's only, there's, there's only so much stuff that's out there. Um, this is one of the risks that we ran into with COVID is that, you know, when COVID hit, we had a, um, a stockpile of some stuff and we tapped into the a strategic national stockpile, which we call the SNS, that's through the CDC. We, you went through all, we burned through that pretty quickly with everyone that was needing it. Then we start going to private contract. We start looking out, you know, to, to the companies to try to burn, uh, purchase it. Directly. Well, the problem was is that everybody else was trying to purchase the same goods and services. Um, you know, and those MOUs that you had in a, in a initially, they were only good as the paper they were written on because they they need the same stuff. 
and there's only so much stuff that can be produced and so quickly. So, but the federal agencies, if it's there, they're going to help us try to get it and they're going to help try to coordinate um, what it's going to do. So, when you look at um, ICS as a quick quiz, you, you now know some examples of how ICS is used uh, to manage incidents. Um, which of the following situations do you think represents another reasonable use of ICS? And uh, Kate, if you can watch for me, because I can't see the, uh, the the chat right now. Um, I'm in my presenter view. If you can watch uh, some of the, just kind of give me the highlights on what um, answers are really coming through, okay? Yeah, you got it. Great. So the coordination of a regional drug take back event for MIC, M MRC volunteers. What would you say? We got one yes. Yes. Yep. All yeses. <laughs> okay, great. Great. All right, next one up. Oh, I got one no. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Uh, the the next one up is the calculation of total volunteer hours for the month of May of 2017. Yeah, we're getting all no's for this one. Okay. Well, maybe no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. All right, next up. The oversight of volunteer safety for a door to door tetanus vaccination effort following a tornado in your region. Yeah, and I'm oh, seeing yeah. like, yeah, I'm seeing them like buzz in now, like they're, they're showing up on my top yeah. screen. So yeah. so, yeah, absolutely. All right, how, and the last one here, what about? Uh, coordination of supplies such as badges, T-shirts, etc., for volunteers at a health screening event for the community. Mm, this one's big. This one's like fifty-fifty yeses and nos. Yeah, I mean, you, you you know, you could go both ways with it. I mean, it really depends size of the event, uh, size of the mm -hmm. event, right? It also depends on how many other um, groups that you're working with. Right, um, it, I you know I'm an ICS purist. You know I, I like to say that you know with ICS that I can use it for anything. You know I'll I'll squeeze I'll squeeze a operation section chief somewhere right, and I'm going to find somebody that's going to get me something right. That logistics person. So you know if you're looking at this coordination of supplies, well, you, somebody had to get the badges, t-shirts, etc. They had to get there right, so that had to be coordinated. Um, it's for volunteers. Right, it's a health screening event, so there's other stuff that's going on there. So, yeah, I mean, if you could implement this ICS with the other organizations that you're partnering with, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I would say that that's definitely something that you could use it at, but I could also see where you might take a step back if it's with organizations that don't want to partner with you, they want to do their own thing, you're not really in control of the event. It, it could be a little bit, um, a, a little bit of an issue, um, trying to get it actually implemented or implemented effectively. All right, so that's great. So incident command and common terminology. So common terminology is one of those things that it says, it says uses plain English to allow personnel from different agencies to work together. So common terminology covers a couple of things. It covers organizational functions, resource descriptions, and incident facilities. So there are terminologies that FEMA makes and says, thou shalt use this name. But sometimes they say, thou shalt use this acronym, which they also say is not plain language. It's not plain English. You know, ICS X is not plain English. If I didn't know what it was coming into it, or I wasn't trained what it was, then I wouldn't know what it was. So it's not common terminology or plain language, but, you know, organizational functions, you know, you I could say ops, which is short for operations, but you may mishear me. You may think I said pops. Um, you may think I said, I need cops. You know, there's lots of different things for organizational functions that it may not be what I'm actually meaning. Um, you know, resource descriptions, and they've gone a long way from FEMA, FEMA's gone a long way to actually uh, do what's called resource typing now, and actually spell out specifically what a resource is, what it entails, 
who it entails because you know it's not just what it is that what may also need an operator so does it include someone to operate said thing so when you have a bulldozer you need somebody that's certified to drive said bulldozer if you have a tractor trailer that has a um a generator hooked up to it you need someone certified to a drive the tractor trailer and B, you need somebody certified to hook the generator up, such as an electrician. So really, you want to make sure that that com common terminology is something that speaks to everyone uh, from the organization, the resource, and then whatever facilities that you're using. So when we use plain English, communication should be in plain English or clear text. Um, and we don't use radio codes, uh, agency-specific codes, or jargon. Um, it, it used to be that 10 codes were used a lot, especially with law enforcement. Um, they've tried to move away from 10 codes because um, 10 codes in one locality may mean something completely different in the neighboring locality. So I may say, you know, 10-8. For 10-8 in my locality, it might be that that's I'm off. I'm basically off the clock. I'm off the radio. I'm at lunch. But in, the, in a neighboring um, locality, 10-8 might mean that, you know, I've got somebody that's in distress. Completely different things, completely different needs, and that can get confusing. So it's better just to spell out exactly what you need um, and be clear with that. So with ICS, we do a lot of management by objectives. Um, so ICS is managed by the objectives that we put forth. Um, every operational period that we have, we develop an incident action plan and that incident action plan is encompassed with those objectives. That's what drives it. What do we want to accomplish over this next operational period? And it might be three different things that we've uh, that we've lined out. So those objectives are communicated throughout the entire or ICS organization and throughout the incident planning process. Um, we put it in the incident action plan. Um, it's what's going to drive the entire incident for us to get from uh, incident to blue sky. Um, you know, the blue sky is, at, at, you know, the end of the rainbow. This is where we're done with everything and it's gotten us through. The thing with that incident action plan is that every incident um, must have an IEP that does a couple of things. So it has to specify the incident objectives. So that's why I say it, dry, it draws the entire incident. It also needs to state the activities uh, to be completed. Um, we also want to cover a time frame called an operational period, and that um, IEP or that incident action plan can be oral or written. So a good example of that is a firefighter, when they get a call from 911, they get dispatched, and they're on the way to the fire. On the way to the fire, they have limited details. So they're already formulating in their head what they're going to do when they get there. If they, if they hear that it's a, a single car incident. Well, they're going to handle this very specific way. Everybody knows what their role is on that particular fire truck. When they hit a single vehicle accident, this is what they're going to do. If it's a larger incident, they're going to think about it a little bit differently. But if they get there and the details that were provided to them initially were completely different, and they're dealing with a completely different beast um, at, at, the, uh, at the, um, the site, then they're going to change that up and they may move into an IEP. They may actually go into a written, go from a, um, an oral one where they're talking back and forth. They may go to a written IEP at that point for documentation purposes. Um, because I always say at the end of the day, if it, if it's not written down, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. If it didn't happen and it's not documented, that's a problem for FEMA. If we have to scale that up to, if we have to go up to state level, we have to go up to federal level. They want those T's crossed and the I's dotted, like I said, and that's why when they pay. So if we don't have the documentation to justify why we did what we did and what we used when we did it, they're not going to give us the money for it in reimbursement. So we have to be very careful about that. So every um, incident action plan has to have four elements. So what do we want to do? That's number one. So in this incident, as part of this action plan that I'm developing with our planning team, what do we want to do? What do we want to accomplish? Two, who's responsible for doing it? We're going to line out who's going to do that job. Three, how do we communicate with each other? So what is the communications plan? In fact, 
in ICS, there's an entire cadre of forms that line this out. Every from the, everything from the incident action plan to a communications plan to um, a safety plan, they're all lined out. There's a form for everything, um, which is great. And then four, what is the procedure if someone is injured? Why does that matter? Well, we don't want anyone to get injured. You know, the responsibility of that safety officer, the responsibility of the incident commander is to uh, actually make sure the, safe, the safety of all those within that incident are doing what they're supposed to do safely. We don't want anyone to get hurt. Um, you know, when we look at things, uh, you know, we don't want to put anyone that's responding in harm's way. So a lot of times, you know, we'll have people that, let's say that in a hurricane situation, you'll, you'll hear stories where, hey, I'm not going to evacuate. We're telling you to evacuate. No, I'm not going to evacuate. I'm going to stay right here. Unfortunately, you know, not not to be mean about it, but it may be we're telling them put your social security number on your arm in a sharpie because that's how we're going to identify you on the back end. Because you know, if it's the eleventh hour, and the eleventh hour they're saying, hey, we need you to come get us and send a helicopter out. Well, unfortunately, in a hurricane, helicopters don't fly very well, right? So we're not sending that out it, during a hurricane. There's flooding. Well, we can't get a, we don't have enough high water vehicles to get out and get you. We gave you your opportunity to evacuate. You didn't evacuate. We can't put somebody in our organization at risk because you decided to stay. So we're going to make sure that your safety is um, paramount. So we're also going to look at um, within the ICS organization, there is no correlation with the administrator structure of any other agency or jurisdiction. So when I said it's not your day to day, you may not operate day to day in your day to day job. You may not have a general, uh, an operations section chief, an incident commander, et cetera. You may have a supervisor, you may have a boss, you know, and you may have people that work under you, but those term, those terms aren't being used generally. So it's not the same structure that you're working or that another agency is working under. This is only applied when we come together for an incident like this and this organization's uniqueness helps to avoid confusion over different position titles, organizational structures, and also someone who serves as a chief every day may not hold that title when deployed or under that ICS structure, as I said earlier. So a big thing with incident command is span of control. And span of control is the number of individuals or resources that one supervisor can manage effectively during an incident. So we do this because it's key to be effective and efficient in an incident management system. If you have a lot of people that you're managing, it doesn't work well. You know, you want to be able to put eyes on people. You want to be able to talk to people. Um, so what do you think that number is? I see uh, everything from 1 to 5, 15 to 20. What else? 10, 8, 12, 20, 7. Are these lottery numbers for tonight? Just checking. All right. So it really, really what we're looking at in span of control, what FEBA's definition is, is between three and seven. The real optimum number to supervise is five people below you. And, you know, like I say, I like being, being able to put eyes on people. If I can't see you and doing what you're doing, one, I can't make sure you're safe. And I can't make sure that you're being efficient and effective in your role. I can scroll up to seven and I've even done up to 10, but really the optimum is really to supervise it is at five people per FEMA. So when we're in an ICS structure, there is a chain of command and a chain of command is the orderly line that details how authority flows. So this allows an incident commander to direct and control the actions of all personnel on the incident. So you notice that in uh, the uh, command staff, you had an incident commander that flows down to his command staff, and that was only three people. Now, there may be people that work for those people, but they're managing those people. So that span of control may go from three. Um, the incident commander may have three, and then from three, those three people may have five people apiece, et cetera. So that's the delegation or the, the uh, line of authority that goes down. And really that avoids any confusion um, by requiring that orders flow from supervisors. So 
I always say direction falls uh, like flows down. So direction is going to flow down, but communication flows up and to your left and right. Um, and somebody asks, uh, does this depend on individuals you regularly work with? Um, not necessarily. It depends on their roles during an incident command, uh, what their role is delegated as an incident command. Um, if you work with them day to day and you're in the same work group and that's how it's delegated out. I mean, I, I know that from, I can speak from like a health department perspective is that sometimes it's going to be the same people within their work group, but in other cases, it's not. Um, you could be asked to work with people that you don't normally work with. But we want to make sure that that orderly flow of authority comes down. So incident commander is going to enact that incident action plan within that incident action plan. That's going to tell everybody what they need to do as part of that process in the incident. Um, they're going to go out and do it. And then the, the response or what happens, the actions that they take, we're going to find out, did it work? There's going to be feedback, right? So that feedback is then going to go back up the chain of command. It's going to go up from the boots on the ground to the operations section chief. From the operations section chief, it's going to go up to the incident commander. So that information is flowing. Now, that same information as it goes up to the section chief, to the operations section chief, may flow linear. That information may actually go right, right? So we have the operations, we have the finance, we have the logistics, we have the planning. They need to know some of those things too in constructing the plan for the next operational period. So that information can flow up, information can flow down, but direct authority is going to flow down. Um, the real issue is two times person is in charge is not competent. Well, uh, unfortunately, sometimes that is the case, um, but that has to be um, something that's brought to the attention of uh, the, the section chiefs. Um, section chiefs are really the ones that are um, looking at how somebody is performing in their role. Um, and that feedback, just like, hey, we, we, we did this. We didn't get the same right response, and that right response didn't come because somebody didn't do their job uh, correctly. That's what the information is going to be passed back up, just like what would happen in your normal day-to-day uh, -day operations. Although you're not handing that information up to your supervisor, you're handing that up to your section chief. Now, I said that I'm going to flash back for a second. So on the last slide, you see chain of command, right? On this next slide, you see unity of command. So unity of command and chain of command are different things. So unity of command is that you will report on to only one incident command system supervisor. So if you are in operations, you report to the operations section chief. You do not report to the planning section chief. You only report to the uh, to the section chief that um, is under um, that that has the care for you. You also receive work assignments only from your ICS supervisor. So in an incident command system, if you're functioning as ICS, you've been given a role in ICS and your normal day-to-day -day, um, boss is giving you command. Now, this works a little bit differently from the, uh, the um, uh, reserve corps side of it, you know, as volunteers. But, you know, when you, you know, when I look at it in your day-to-day, -day, it's your same supervisor is not gonna be giving you that direction. Um, so and then when you're assigned to an incident, um, you're no longer uh, report directly to your day-to-day -to -day supervisor. Um, again, that, that's what I was saying is that it's a little bit different from uh, in a volunteer situation because, you know, you have your day-to-day -day jobs, you have your normal lives that you work. This is more that, you know, it, you, may, you need to really report to whoever that's in charge of you under that incident command st structure. It's just more to the point that you're not taking direction from somebody else that tells you to do something different within that structure, you're only reporting to one person and that's the unity of command. Um, you report to one person um, and that, that, that those rules and things are lay, laid down from as part of the, um, uh, as part of the command structure. So some ICS nuggets. Now these are some little tidbits of things to remember that are really the core. Uh, Cause tonight what we really looked at is the it's kind of a summary of the ICS uh, 100 and the one ICS 700, um, which are available online through FEMA. It's a online; those are online courses that you can get certificates for. This is just a summary to kind of wet your whistle, give you a little idea, and to let you know that it's not something to be afraid of. Like when we start talking incident command system, it's not something to shy away from. It's something to embrace. And when going to take those types of courses, they're free. 
You can take them online. They're available in train. Um, so you can take those courses without a problem. But these are some of the nuggets that are takeaways that I want you to have for tonight is that incident commander has overall responsibility for an incident. They're, they're, they're signing at the end of the day, they're signing off their name saying, hey, I agree that this is what we're doing. I agree this is what we did, and I'm taking responsibility for it. Um, the next thing is the standard terminology is used to help reduce confusion between ICS and day-to-day -day positions. So making sure we're using that common terminology, plain, plain English. The next um, nugget is span of control varies from three to seven, and the optimal is five. And the last thing on there is incident action plans establish the overall incident objectives, strategies, and tactics. So incident uh, objectives, strategies, and tactics, that's what goes into the incident action plan, and that's what guides an incident. So those are some, uh, let's see, if we've completed FEMA online courses in 2021. Do we do renewal or certification? No, you do not. Once you take them, you are done. That's the beauty of it. Um, the courses and training, I'll get to that at the end of this, um, but I was just letting you know that they are available. Uh, but yeah, the good thing about when you take these courses, the 100, 200, 700, et cetera, all the different uh, cadre of the courses, the, the, you take them once, you don't have to take them again. Now, they have changed them slightly over the years, and they've got new additions. So you'll see a courses listed of like 100.A, .B, .C, D, et cetera. As long as you're taking the most current one, that, that's fine. You don't have to go back and take the, uh, the courses prior to that. And you don't have to take them again. So that's a good thing. So time to play your best guess. So there are four different questions I'm going to ask, ask for you. And Kate, if I can get your assistance and try to help me uh, wrangle these answers again, I would greatly appreciate yeah. it. Awesome. You got it. Thank you. Uh, so the first question is, which incident command position is responsible for all incident activities, including the development of strategies, tactics, and the ordering and release of resources? We're getting incident commander, commander, commander. incident commander. Okay, I'm getting a lot of incident commander and ding, 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 ding. You are correct. The incident commander is the person that's responsible for all of that. They're the ones that are in charge at the end of the day. They're signing their name at it and saying, hey, I'm taking responsibility for it. All right, next question. Your best guess. As a volunteer, which section chief would you likely work under during an incident? Would it be A, logistics, B, planning, or C, operations? Uh, mostly C. I see a lot of C's, and you are correct. Mm -hmm. You are boots on the ground. You are what makes this clock tick. The, the clock we call ICS. Y'all are awesome. So that's great. All right. So the next question. Uh, let's see here. Using, um, so we're going to do a, a scenario now. So looking at a practice scenario, outbreak response. So using ICS in public health, Let's say that there's a tuberculosis outbreak in the fictional town of Mountain View, Virginia. All right. So a TB outbreak, tuberculosis outbreak in the fictional town of Mountain View, Virginia. Stay with me here. What functions or activities do you see for MRC volunteers to support this incident response? Hit me with your best shots. See, Operation, uh, logistics, intake, contact tracing, testing, testing yeah, yeah, Op operations, testing, vaccine, supplies, testing. Yeah, you could MRC volunteers could do a lot of functions or activities within a TB outbreak. Um, you fill a lot of roles, which is great. Um, yeah, all of so, yeah. <laughs> what'd you say, Kate? I was somebody said all of the above. Oh yeah, all of the above. I mean, really, you know, it's uh, that's the great thing about our MRC is that it's plug and play. Um, you know, you have skills that can be applied, and you. you well, I'll say this: you are more than warm bodies out there, right? 
a lot of times people go, oh, let's just throw a warm body in there. You can't do that, right? Especially from the medical side, right? We we there there are things that have to happen, and y'all are doing a great job with that. So that's that's awesome. All right. So next question is which general staff position might the district nurse manager serve during that outbreak? So it's a TB outbreak in that town. Which general staff position might the district nurse serve during that outbreak? Medical branch lead, supervisor, all, we're all different leadership. I see a medical manager. manager. Oh, I saw <laughs> incident commander, logistics operations. So across the board, I mean, and really none of those answers are wrong. Wrong. That that that's the awesome part about ICS is that depending upon that locality and how they uh, how they function with their ICS, she may have any of those roles. But what I would say from a nurse, a district nurse manager position, more than like she might actually be the incident commander, unless it's a really large outbreak, that may be the health director. But um, as far as the general staff position, they may be the incident commander. But when you get down to the general staff side, they're more than likely looking at either um, an operations section chief. Um, they could also be planning. You know, planning is a consideration there too, because they're really looking at, you know, that 12, 48, 72 hour window of you know we've got these patients it's 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 expanding out we need to plan for this um so yeah i mean they can fill a lot of those different roles it really comes down to how they're being applied in that locality all right next question during your shift while working this incident you notice that a critical supply is running low and about to run out who would you report that to so during your shift Working the incident, you notice that a critical right supply is running low. I see logistics, your supervisor. Logistics supervisor, yeah. My supervisor, then logistics. I, I would say both, you know, you because remember that information is flowing up and it's flowing around, right? Because mm -hmm. who needs to know that information? Well, yeah, your, your supervisor needs to know because they need to know on what to plan for when the next person replaces you, right? So, yeah, they definitely need to know. But logistics also needs to know because they need to find more stuff, right? They they need to, they need to go get more of that critical supply. If it's running low, it's better for them to know now before you're out. Because then, mm -hmm. let's say that you had to shut your shift down. Let's say that you had to shut the clinic down because we don't have any more. So yeah, those would be the two people that really need to know. And then that information is going to be filled, filtered further out on who needs to know um, after that. But yeah, definitely your supervisor, your your um your section chief, your operations section chief, and then um, the log logistics section chief would need to know. All right, so last question. When you look at this, 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 this diagram here, is this NIMS or is it ICS? And I'm seeing the right answers. ICS. This oh, is oh, ICS. <laughs> right. This is this, this right here. This is your brick in the house. The house is NIMS. ICS is the brick. If you don't have ICS, what happens to a brick house when you're missing bricks? It falls down. Right. So it is such a, a thing that you need to actually implement it. That's why it makes it so uh, such a permanence within NIMS. You can't have NIMS without ICS. So, great. So, some things to remember. So, things I want you to remember as part of this is that you may someday be a non leader placed in a position of leadership. And I want you to know that you can do it. Okay. <laughs> so, don't say, oh, I don't want to, I, I don't want to, I don't want to work with people and I don't want to tell people what to do. I believe in you. You can do it. All right. We can ask of you only what we know that you can do, and I know that you can do it. That's why you could be asked, okay? Also, you may be a leader placed into a position of non-leadership, so you have to remember you can't do everything yourself. So you may be a leader, and you may be, you know, all inspiring out there, but in the case of this ICS structure, I need you to do a different role, and it's not a leadership role. But the way that you can lead in that is to do your job effectively, right? 
take that hat off of your normal uh, supervisor role, put a different hat on. And lastly, try to apply ICS during your everyday activities to learn the terminology for use during an emergency. So next Thanksgiving, next Christmas, I want you to fill out those ICS roles. I want you to figure out who's gonna pay for that ICS, who's gonna pay for that Thanksgiving meal? Cause that's gonna be your finance and management, right? I want you to find out who's gonna be your PIO, who's gonna get the word out on who's bringing what, right? Who's your operations? Who's in the kitchen toiling away, blood, sweat, and tears in the kitchen, making the turkey look like a hockey puck after it's been cooked too long? That's right. You got to fill those roles out, but use that ICS and see how it works for you. All right. I also want you to know that um, your what your individual responsibilities will be for all emergencies. So when you go back and you think in your MRC group, you know what role could I fill? What can I do or what do I want to do? What do I strive to do? Find that out. Know what your role and responsibility is. And if you know what it is, you can be tasked to do it, right? Um, also, prepare yourself and family too. Um, you can only serve others if you're prepared to be at, uh, prepared at home first. Um, you really need to know that your family is taken care of. I, I, I know I do. I've got, I got four kids, a wife multiple animals. I got cats like chirping on the back of my chair right now. So I want to make sure when I leave and I have to go staff the emergency operations center that they're taken care of, that there's a plan in place. They have somewhere to go. If the power goes out, if the heat goes out, there's some place for them to go while I'm away. All right. So with that in mind, I got one more video to show you. Okay. So just bear with me. Hold on a second, let me get it. All right, I know this isn't any fun to talk about, but we should. Okay, so who's gonna do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect, that's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And I'll try to get the generator going without any gas. Oh, let's not forget the cell phones, which probably won't work. Right. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. Well, I think we couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. So I always like showing that video because that is my family. <laughs> you know, they're always going to forget what they need to pack. They they are all they have great intentions, but you can only prepare so much, and you got it. You you got to get them involved, right? Uh, teach them young, get them involved. But I want to make sure that you're taken care of, your family's taken care of, and know that when you're put into a role, I know you can do it. All right. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Kate. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, but Kate. Uh, I know you have some closing out housekeeping things to do, but I want to thank you for your time today and allowing me to um, blather on um, uh, for the better part of an hour.